folks, and welcome to Open Analysis Live. So as you can probably tell, uh, today's episode is a little bit different from what we've been doing in the past. I actually have a special guest here. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about when to bug. And we're going to talk about sort of the basics of how to set it up, how to start debugging with it. And if you guys are familiar with x64 debug, which we use in most of our tutorials, we're going to kind of try to show you guys uh, side by side, if you're familiar with x64 debug, sort of how to do the same things in when to bug. And this is going to be sort of the first in a series of possibly two tutorials, two or three, depending on how this goes, where we go a little bit deeper into debugging into the kernel. But for this episode, we're just going to do a sort of an initial how to set up when debug, how to debug stuff with it, uh, how to navigate around. So uh, joining me today is Josh. Uh, this is the third time we've tried to record with Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties have uh, stymied us in the past. Uh, hopefully we can make this work this time. So welcome, Josh. Thanks for coming here. And uh, if you want to explain a bit about who you are and uh, what you do. Yeah, uh, so I've been doing reverse engineering for uh, a few years now, but I do malware analysis full time now, and we actually work together. Full disclosure. <laughs> um, which has been really, really awesome um, as of recently. And yeah, effectively, uh, I've been doing a few talks here and there, but I wanted to do a video tutorial for, for you guys today on WinDebug because I think it's a really useful tool, especially when you start getting into areas that uh, like things like x64 debug can't handle, like transitioning from x86 to x64 code. Uh, which we might do in a later video, and a number of other reasons. Yeah, I should also mention that uh, when we first tried to record this, uh, I, I didn't actually work with Josh, and uh, <laughs> I just I, I met him at Recon, and we were talking, and he had some neat ideas about what to, some videos to record. So we tried recording it, and uh, things went completely haywire while we were doing it. And uh, Josh had to debug stuff uh, live, and I realized that he's actually like really good at debugging stuff. So that's why uh, that's why I had him on here. Uh, he's really modest, but he actually is quite good. <laughs> the debugger. Yeah, so what I wanted to just give you a, be a brief background on is what WinDebug is, why it seems to be important to use, and why you should use it, and uh, why you probably hear about it a lot. So uh, there's a lot of people who are a lot better at using WinDebug than me, but it's effectively like the de facto debugging interface for interfacing with the Windows operating system. So you'll see a lot of people like Alex e and SKU do debugging live in WinDebug in talks and things like that. And I think the reason for this is just because it's effectively what Microsoft uses for debugging their content. So I think a lot of people use it for exploit development uh, during their exploit development process and for doing a lot of kernel debugging, which I'm not really aware of uh, many other commercial debuggers or free debuggers that allow you to do that on Windows. You'll often hear it called windbag. I think that's mostly because of autocorrect. I don't know why people call it that, but um, if you hear that in a conversation at a conference or whatever, or talk, uh, they're probably talking about WinDebug. So just to give a brief overview of what the interface kind of looks like. This is a workspace that I've customized with this fancy looking text. Usually it doesn't look as good when you initially open it, but I can link this workspace in the bottom of this video. But essentially what you want to take away here is when you open WinDebug, it will effectively look like there are zero windows. Uh, it will essentially look like this. And this might be daunting at first because you'll basically usually just be given the command window and you can do everything you want in the command window, but it will make visualizing memory and things like that a little bit more difficult, which is why I like to set up the workspace properly with a bunch of different GUI windows. So I'll uh, just show you how to do that. The first window, obviously, that I've already gone through is commands. And if you want to open an executable, click on this file menu and then go to open executable and then well, let's, let's just use notepad here as an example to start with. And basically it'll give you a whole bunch of output right off the bat. So there's a few tidbits that are really important here and I'll go into symbols more closely in a, in a second here. But basically uh, what this is doing, it's showing you all the module loads. So these are uh, all of the required modules that would be in the import table for notepad. And then this is just showing as they're loaded by the windows loader itself. And then there's uh, some symbol information associated with each of these modules and I'll show you how to resolve those symbols using the public symbols 
from Microsoft. But just to give you a little bit of uh, more detail here, um, we have a breakpoint that is set. Um, it is a first chance breakpoint. Um, those are exception related, but we don't really have to go into that specifically today. But basically, when debug is set a breakpoint at this uh, loader p do debugger break function within NTDLL. We've also gotten a dump of all of the active registers here. So since it's the x86 version of Notepad, then we get uh, things like EIP and the stack pointer and stuff like that. So that's kind of what things will look like when you initially load it. You can basically do everything from this window, but as I said, we want to set things up a little bit nicer. If you want to add more windows, it's very similar to like IDA or any other debug interface where you can open additional windows uh, from the view panel um, up here. So here there's a bunch of different panels that we'll want to add. Some are more important than others. So the first and I think probably one of the most important is memory. So this will basically just show you the memory of the running process and you can adjust the formats for how the memory is displayed. So currently it's in the byte format, which is quite useful. It's um, like the kind of XXD output of ASCII and hexadecimal and then the address to the left. You can adjust that though to like be pure ASCII if you want to have it. I don't know why you would want it in bits, but if you really wanted to. And then, yeah, you can have like integers. Uh, Unicode is also super useful, but usually I'll leave most of my windows in, in byte just so you can see the ASCII representation and, and the byte representation. So there is some somewhat important syntax here. Scope IP is actually basically just going to track the current EIP register. And these are just syntactical things to help resolve the symbols quickly. So this is what's referred to as a pseudo register. So you can actually um, look up all the pseudo registers and uh, in MSDN. And this will basically show you each of the ones that will be within WinDebug. So if we go down to scope EIP, basically the instruction pointer for the local context. So I guess the local context is referred to as the scope, just to give you some background there. While we're here, another really important pseudo register is uh, EX entry, which is essentially the entry point for, for the binary. But before we go off in that tangent, that's just kind of uh, important to keep in mind for later. So if we go back to this window and we go back to our view panel, let's look at a number of other important windows that we'll want to add. Registers. So this is a, will essentially just give you like a nicer register view, uh, similar to other debuggers. So the current state of, of all the registers, including like the uh, floating point registers and uh, all the flags that you would see in other debuggers. Buggers. And obviously flags are really important for things like jumps, it's something to keep in mind. Then there's uh, another super important view, which is disassembly. So this will actually give you a uh, linear disassembly of uh, your current context or whatever you set this offset to be. And so one important thing to note about the disassembly window that uh, kind of bugs me, I guess, when I use window bug is that it's not really interactive in the same way that something like x64 debug is interactive, where you can sort of, I don't know, click on jumps and follow the jumps and stuff like that. It really is just kind of a view of the disassembly, unfortunately. So if you want to do something like follow a jump or something like that, you'll have to actually copy that address out uh, and use it in the uh, command window to navigate around, uh, which is, I guess, probably for me, that's probably one of the hardest things getting used to with WinDebug. I don't know if there's some plugins or something that make it more interactive, but for me, I guess that's probably just one heads up is uh, if you're trying to click around to follow stuff, it, it definitely doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I think like once you get used to the command line syntax, then you can like do reference at the current like EIP scope and stuff like that. And then you could probably do it quickly in some fancy command line ways. But yeah, when it comes to user accessibility at a baseline level, I think x64 debug wins there. And yeah, just uh, one more note. I, and I know I just mentioned this, but uh, this is linear sweep for the disassembly, whereas something like um, IDA Pro, which we will also be using today, is recursive for their disassembly technique. So it's not, uh, it's pretty primitive, but it's it works for what we need it for. So back to the window. Windows. If we look at uh, a few more important ones, um, things like call stack. Uh, so I think this will actually try and resolve the call stack uh, to symbols. And based on return instructions, I think it will attempt to resolve the call stack as well. So this can be really useful when you have the actual symbols, like if you're debugging a uh, Microsoft Windows application or if you have the symbols from another manufacturer. Um, otherwise, I think it will basically just try and try to unwind the stack as best as it can. And then you have a whole bunch of useful headers here 
if you uh, if you do have the debugging information, um, like these are raw arguments, which will basically just show you the first three arguments into that address, regardless of whether or not they're they're valid. And then I think there's like some additional header and uh, different information that you can add here. So a bunch of the other windows are quite important, but uh, I'll usually stack them on top of each other. So like things like Scratchpad, it's literally just like a little notepad that you can add. So usually I'll like stack this on top of calls and you can actually, if it wants to let me, you can actually stack these on top of each other and then it'll open up these little tabs um, that you can go back and forth with. Uh, I'll usually do that for uh, windows that I don't use as often that are not memory disassembly or command or registers. Other useful ones that I deem as like a little bit less important are the processes and threads window. So like this will, what's what's really awesome about WinDebug and I'll show you how to do it is you, you can actually like enable child process debugging. So then uh, you can actually debug multiple processes at the same time from the same window. So then uh, you can select different threads from this window here and different processes if you were debugging multiple processes. And there's a few more that you can take a look at, but uh, that's basically what I use for um, malware analysis. So one of the more interesting things that Josh had shown me before was the way that the memory window actually works. So in that little virtual box up at the top where we have the scope IP, uh, you can actually change that to be any address, of course, right? And it'll show you the memory for that address. And uh, I noticed that like if we we're trying to say mimic uh, x64 debug, I think Josh might have this in a workspace or something. Uh, he'll show you in a minute. But I just uh, wanted to point out that like that memory window is basically like the same as the dump window in x64. 64 debug. So you can look at any memory you want at all. Um, and you can have as many memory windows open as you want. So you can have uh, something sort of analogous to x64 debug where you have a bunch of different dump windows. So if you want to follow a bunch of different memory segments, it's quite simple to just open more and change that virtual address to be uh, whatever address you want to follow. Again, I think Josh has that set up in his workspace. He's going to show you in a minute. But uh, it's definitely something if you're coming from x64 debug and you want to have that sort of setup, which I find really useful for unpacking stuff, um, to have all those memory views open, uh, that memory window can be customized to show you anything you want, basically. Yeah, a really useful memory address to keep in one of these memory windows is the one of the stack pointer, just because because you'll want to keep track of arguments on the stack and everything like that. So that's one example of one of the uses for a memory window at all times. So yeah, so I think we can get rid of this super ugly workspace that I've just created and then just open the one that I have pre-configured. So if we open this again, we essentially uh, don't have many memory windows, but we can add a few more. And then they'll just snap in there like that, which is really useful, but I'm going to adjust these just because uh, we are gonna be using the command window quite often. And then we can get rid of stuff like Scratchpad because um, I won't use that very often. But essentially this is very similarly set up to uh, how we had it before. Um, so as you can see, uh, the at syntax here is used to uh, dereference this register symbol. And this will actually keep us within scope of the current stack pointers. So that will look very similar. So if we um, open an executable here, let's uh, dive into some commands. So, and here uh, we've actually used the pointer and symbol um, display format for memory. And then it gives you like an actual nice, um, if there's a symbol associated with the address, then it will display it on the right here, which is very similar to how something like x64 debug would work. So now that we have this opened in WinDebug, before we get into our actual commands, I just want to show you how to resolve symbols for WinDebug because they are required for a whole bunch of different functionality um, within the debugger itself. So if we just open our command prompt window here, um, I'm just going to clear out what we had in here before. But basically, um, if you go under C program files x86 Windows Kits 10. So this is this will differ based on your version of Windows. So if you are using Windows 7 SDK, then this path will differ. Debugger is x64. Uh, you will have this binary called syncheck. Um, so just to back up a bit, because some of you might not know what the Windows SDK is. If you literally Google like SDK Windows 7 or SDK Windows 8.1 or SDK Windows 10, you can download this binary here. Uh, if you go to download installer, and then once that's downloaded, um, I think this should let me select it. Yeah. Um, all you want to select in this window is debugging tools for Windows. And uh, you can 
deselect all the rest of this. And then once you hit download, it it will install it. And then uh, you will have um, all of your debugging tools um, under this path here. So going back to actually resolving those symbols, uh, you have the sim check command, um, which will actually download and uh, store the symbols for you at a specified path. So they have some uh, general examples here. Uh, if you want to download symbols from Microsoft, you can actually host your own symbol server or something like that if you'd really want to. But just going back to how you would do that, you can use SimCheck and specify a DLL for which you want to resolve symbols. And then you specify a path at which you want to download those symbols. So in this case, this is just the Microsoft symbol server over HTTP. And then you specify a path to write those symbols to. So in this case, I'm just using C colon backslash symbols. And once you hit enter, these, these symbols are already downloaded, but this will download the symbols for kernel 32. And then if it worked, it will basically say pass plus ignored files equals to one. One important note here uh, is that obviously you're not going to have symbols for the malware sample that you're analyzing, but definitely for the Microsoft DLLs that are being loaded. And of course, the, that's really what we're downloading symbols for here. And one thing to pay close attention to is the difference between uh, 80, x86 and 64-bit uh, DLLs. So of course, if you're on a 64-bit Windows system, there's going to be two different sets of DLLs. One's for x86 execution, so the 32-bit execution, and one's for 64-bit. Uh, make sure you download the correct DLLs for the correct type of malware that you're analyzing. That's definitely bit me in the past, <laughs> as recently as the last time we recorded this video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just to show you, um, so the SysWow64 folder will give you the 32-bit version of each of those DLLs on a 64-bit Windows platform. So if you want to specify which DLL to download the 32-bit symbols for, then you can just specify the SysWow64 path. And the 64-bit um, DLLs will reside under the normal System32 path. So for getting started, the DLLs that I'd suggest resolving the symbols for, if you don't want to download the symbols for every DLL, say in the System32 folder, um, I would suggest getting empty DLL because those are used by a number of different commands within WinDebug. And then just getting uh, kernel32, which will give you a large amount of symbols for functions that are often used by a different malware. So this is really important to do ahead of time because you can actually make WinDebug automatically resolve symbols for any module that's loaded, but obviously you don't want your malware analysis machine connected to the internet when you are debugging malware, unless you're on like a throwaway VPS or something, but um, I'll usually do my analysis on a disconnected machine. So that's essentially the gist of symbols. That's probably the most annoying part of using WinDebug is just getting all of the symbols resolved. But once you do, then things are quite okay. And then once you have all the symbols resolved, then you'll have a bunch of different commands that you can actually make use of. So the first and probably some of the most important commands that I want to go over are breakpoint commands. So so the first one that you want to set upon entry. So obviously this is not the entry point of the binary in question. So if you want to do a breakpoint on the entry point of the binary itself, then you do BP EX entry. And then to continue, it's actually G for go. And then that's essentially just a breakpoint that's hit on the entry point of Notepad here. So that's a, a good tip for those of you coming from X64 debug. You may just be used to X64 debug automatically setting that breakpoint on the entry point to the uh, loaded module or the loaded EXE. Windebug doesn't do that, right? So Windebug is like running with scissors. You can do whatever you want, but they don't do it for you. So uh, pretty much every time you load a binary, you're going to want to set a breakpoint on that entry point. Uh, just so that you end up uh, at the entry point when you start debugging. And then if we want to list the set breakpoints, you do BL. And then there's these little hyperlinks here, and this will like actually do the commands for you. But it's probably important to actually just try and do them yourself so it's faster. So you can do BC, which is breakpoint clear, and then specify the index of the breakpoint. Um, then you can actually do BC star. Obviously, there's no more breakpoints set now, and that will clear all breakpoints that you currently have. For setting breakpoints on functions that we we really actually care about, you can just specify um, the symbol itself. So if we wanted to do a breakpoint on virtual alloc, you just do BP virtual alloc. Obviously for most malware unpacking, we want to set a breakpoint on the return address of these functions. So um, for that, we can actually just, we can navigate to the address of 
virtual alloc in this disassembly window. And then we can just look up the return instruction for that function. So this would, it would be to suggest here and then set a breakpoint there. We will actually do that when we are debugging real malware and not notepad but I just want to show you a few more commands before we do that. So really important stuff for getting the overall memory layout. You can do a bang address. And then here, let me make this a little bigger for you. This will just give you the general memory layout. One really useful thing you can do is actually specify bang address and then you provide it an address. So say I want to look up the memory information for our current instruction pointer address, then this will actually give us base address of the module, the end address. So this will be useful for uh, when we get like virtually allocked sections and then you get the memory permissions and then uh, the type of the mapped image and, and all of this information. So it's really useful. And then there's all these cool like little hyperlinks. So if you do DH, which is essentially the, the header, uh, information for the portable executable. This will all be dumped in kind of plain text here. So that's, that's super useful. So also keep in mind, if you guys are familiar with the setup from x64 debug, so that's uh, what Josh has just shown you with the bang address, that's the same as saying uh, view memory map. So where you're showing all those different allocated sections uh, in x64 debug, this is just another way to do it. Um, basically do the same thing in the debug. Yeah, and then if we want to see the loaded modules, for the current binary. So obviously while we're debugging, malware will more often than not load additional modules and stuff like that. So we can do LM, which will essentially just list uh, all of the loaded DLLs in memory. And then um, whether or not we have resolved symbol information for each of those modules. So in this case, I've downloaded the symbol information for kernel 32. Um, and this is under that symbol path you can see here. Um, so it's called w, w kernel 32 because it's the Syswa 64 or 32-bit version of, of that module. And then you can see the NTDLL one down here that we've also resolved the symbols for. So this is really useful if you're like, ah, I don't know why this, this symbol isn't resolving. You can also list the modules this way. So you can actually specify a module name. So say, this is kind of a, a, a lame example, but um, if you do lm-m, you can specify a string with a wildcard, and uh, then, then it will give you the modules with that associated with it. Then you can actually specify a memory offset. So again, if we just use the base address of this, then we can see the associated module with that address. So let's take a look at actual symbols associated with said modules once we've resolved them. We can use the X command for examining symbols of a specific module. So if we do x kernel 32 bang virtual star, then that will actually give us any virtual associated function symbol for the kernel 32 module. So this will actually, uh, you can see it's, there's like virtual protect in here. Um, these, are, these are just stubs. I believe that's just because of this version of kernel 32. And then uh, this examining symbol information will also give you uh, information as to whether or not there's like parameter information. Unfortunately, with the Microsoft Windows versions of these symbols, there's not uh, parameter information. So that's quite frustrating, but it's what they've decided to do. <laughs> so. So I think that's a pretty good overview of the modules and symbols associated with those modules. If you want to get things like a call stack, that would be in that call stack window. You can do K. You can also do find stack, which will basically look for a string within each stack of each thread. Uh, it's quite useful. It, say you're debugging like a whole bunch of different threads and you need to find like a certain function that's executing, that's like writing a piece of unpacked memory or whatever. Um, you can search for a certain function within a certain thread. Here I just use kernel 32 and it's and uh, it's found that string in every single running thread. There's one more thing that I wanted to cover. So you can actually look at uh, struct offsets and a bunch of other really useful things with the downloaded symbols as well. So just as an example, uh, if we go to uh, our memory window here and we specify uh, notepad, then it'll give us the PE header. And as some of you may know, a struct for uh, the current PE header, not the MZ header, is image NT headers. So if we actually specify the offset of the PE um, signature here, so that is um, at 00FD00F8, if we just copy that 
and specify our address at which that struct should resolve, then we can just dereference that struct. So really useful information for like, obviously this is just a PE header in this instance, but if there's a struct that's being returned by some function, then it's really useful to be able to navigate the offsets of that struct using uh, this DT command. And then you can uh, like click on the struct offsets if they're resolved. And then you can like, we, we could walk the whole PE header um, just from like WinDebug itself, which is pretty sweet. So uh, a few more things like editing memory is pretty important. So one like cool example that I found is for those who do, who do not know, uh, the process environment block has a flag that is set when the process is being debugged. And it's very common for malware to walk the process environment block and then try and see if that flag is set and then exit as an anti-debugging technique. So if we wanted to set that flag to zero, you can do um, like E for edit, byte, and then you can specify $pEB, uh, which is the process environment block, and then the offset at which you want to edit the memory. And then we can literally just set that to zero and then that will make it so that anti-debugging trick no longer works. So if we quickly pull up the PEB in Wikipedia, you guys can see that that offset two uh, is actually the is debugged flag. Uh, it's hard to see here because you're just seeing an offset, but if we see a visualization here. So basically you guys can see here, so that's the structure of the process environment block. And you can see that the uh, second byte is this uh, being debugged flag. Funny enough, if you guys use things like Silohide for uh, x64 debug, uh, this is one of the things that they do automatically for you is they killed that little flag there. But yeah, so you can basically manipulate those structures any way you want from the debugger here, you know, simply writing to it. Awesome. Sorry, just a few more things. Um, you can do things like restart, uh, and that will actually restart the running process. You can also do uh, all of these things from the menu itself here. So you know how I was specifying that G command? You can actually select to go from the menu here. You can hit stop debugging here, et cetera. So let's actually open up a real piece of malware, and then I'll show you things like stepping and, and other really useful uh, debugging techniques. So um, again, we'll want to set a, a breakpoint at EX entry because now we're running a real piece of malware. We don't want it getting away on us. Uh, just to give you some backgrounds, this is a sample from malware traffic analysis that I used in a talk I did in September at B-Sides Edmonton. And basically it is a crypto jacker spreader. So I think it can be used for spreading anything. Um, it's just a specified C2 uh, download and execution. But at the time it was being used to spread a uh, crypto jacking piece of malware, which for those of you who do not know, is just a um, crypto miner running on somebody's machine without them knowing. So if we hit go here, we'll actually be at the entry point. And let's just take a quick look at this in IDA because then we can get a better idea of, of what we want to do with this. So I'm just going to open it up in IDA free 7.0. And I just have the binary here. And I will link to the malware traffic analysis post that this is from and specify exactly which binary it is. But if we start looking at the strings, for example, things look pretty normal, but there's not stuff like C2, et cetera, um, that we want. <laughs> so if we go to really, really common functions that are used for unpacking, things like global alloc, if we check out the offset of global alloc here, I knew this was used in the unpacking process ahead of time, just because I had looked at the sample before, but this is a really good example for something that we can unpack with WinDebug. So um, if we look at global alloc here, this is set to a global variable. Um, we'll just still call that allocated memory for now. Just in case anybody missed that, Josh was just looking at uh, EAX and he just basically labeled the uh, variable that EAX was moved into. If you guys look up the definition for global alloc in MSDN, you can see that it's a standard Windows API call. So that means the return variable is going to be stored in EAX. So yeah, I think we've showed this quite a few times in other videos, but just in case anyone's new to this, um, that's why he labeled that. Yeah. And then we see another really common call here of virtual protect of a, um, or well, this isn't a call to, to virtual protect. They're calling get proc address, which will resolve the address of virtual protect. And then they're putting that into a variable name. So something really useful since we have IDA open is prefacing variables and function names with malware. Um, this is just really good for looking through things that you've already labeled that might not have already been automatically marked up by IDA. So we'll just call it malware or virtual effect. 
And then down here, we can see that they're actually calling virtual protect with our allocated memory block. And then they are calling that allocated memory block. So this is really common to see with unpackers where they are writing piece of memory, doing something with that memory, and then jumping into it with the call instruction, which is essentially like a jump. So in previous videos, we've called this self-injection for lack of a better term, but we showed you guys this in other videos. Yeah, this is a nice, a nice sample. So what we'll want to do is since we already know this is going to be called, uh, we can actually just set breakpoints on these locations and then uh, jump into the position independent code that's allocated by the uh, unpacker here. So uh, to start with, we can actually just set a breakpoint on uh, this address. Luckily, there's no ASLR with, with this binary. So um, it's the exact same address in uh, Windabug. So we can, so the, and that breakpoint results properly. So I just want to double check that is in DR caller. And then if we go, then we hit our breakpoint. So uh, kind of interesting here is um, this memory section is allocated here. So say we wanted to uh, like look up um, the memory information about that range, uh, then we can just hit our bang address command and then it'll give us uh, the, the range for that memory. So now at this point, if we say we wanted to do full analysis of this piece of malware, including the unpacking process, then we would uh, dump this to disk, uh, open an IDA, mark it up and figure out exactly how the unpacking is being done. But what we really care about here is the final binary that we're going to extract. So um, I actually know that this unpacker is going to call virtual alloc, which is very often called by most packers for allocation of memory. So so um, I'm just going to set a breakpoint on virtual alloc and uh, hit go. And I know I should be setting this on the on the return address, but in this case, um, they are not checking for that. Um, but actually, I kind of realized I haven't showed single stepping here, just breakpoints. So um, why don't we just single step into this piece of malware? Um, so for that, you can just hit F8, or you can use the debugging menu here. But obviously, you don't want to be opening this menu over and over again. Um, but step into, you can use F8. So now we've jumped into uh, that memory segment that we just looked up all the information about. And uh, we can single step through this. So this is also um, very common. Uh, so this is actually getting the process environment block. This is very common to see in unpacking as well, where you'll see the malware itself manually dereferencing this offset to get the process environment block. And then it does a bunch of stuff to, to resolve library addresses. So that's a tip for you guys. Uh, anytime you see that FS30 hex in a piece of position independent code, and then you see them start to dereference the pointers after uh, they return or after they get that address at FS30, then you probably have found a place where they're doing some dynamic import resolution. So that's probably where they're trying to resolve some APIs dynamically. Usually what they do is they find an offset to kernel 32 from the uh, PEB, from the process environment block, and then they use that to actually resolve uh, some APIs so that they start calling them. So yeah, it, it does actually do a dynamic resolution of functions um, that it needs, um, but I am going to skip ahead just for, for time's sake. So if we just hit go, we're going to hit this virtual alloc call, and then you can actually do step out. So step out is the same as run until return uh, in x64 debug. Yeah, exactly. So um, if we look at EAX here, then we'll actually get the return address for this. And since I did not set my <laughs> workspace up properly. I'm going to add more memory windows. And then I am going to get that address just in this memory here so that we can uh, monitor it. So now that we've actually uh, done that, I know that this is um, the unpacking function for this portable executable. So I'm actually going to set a, uh, a breakpoint after this. So let's just set the breakpoint on that raw address. So BP and then that there. And then, um, but I am going to step into this because I just want to show you the unpacking process as it kind of unfolds. So, um, so this is a bunch of instructions that you can go through manually, but I just wanted to go through it quickly to show you um, that we can see uh, the MZ here. And then uh, I'm just going to hit uh, G for go. And then we can see a full portal executable. So since we set a breakpoint on the address that would be returned to after that function finishes, it doesn't continue executing. And then we can see a full like PE header here. So now if we want to write the memory from this memory offset to disk so we can analyze it, we can use the dot write mem command. And then we can specify a file name. So we'll just do uh, dump.bin. 
under C colon backslash, and then we'll specify the starting and ending offsets. So since I don't really know the starting and ending offsets of this memory, I can just do bang address and then uh, 30,000. And then we can get the base address and end address here, which is really useful. And then we'll specify that. And then this is just how you specify a memory range. And then uh, it says, um, for, for whatever reason, it goes like uh, over by one byte, and then it says it's inaccessible, but we've actually written that binary to disk. Um, before we get out of WinDebug here and back into IDA, some like really useful stuff um, that we can do with this memory image while it's sitting in memory or like unpacked code or uh, deobfuscated strings or stuff like that is um, being able to search it. So if we do uh, S-A, that's looking for ASCII, and then we have to specify a range, and then we can just say something like HTTP. And then we got some uh, like beginnings of like C2s there. So yeah, um, that will, so, so the problem with uh, this search dash A command is, um, is it will only look for del uh, ASCII delimited strings. So if there's like a random null byte in your config or whatever that you're trying to uh, search for in memory using ASCII, um, it might only find a part of it or it might, the search might not find your specified pattern because um, it might be uh, terminated by a null byte. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, yeah, so now that we've written that to disk, Let's open up our dumped binary in IDA and make sure that it is our final stage. So for those of you who are coming to this from x64 debug, that little write mem with the range is, that's equivalent to you right clicking on the uh, memory section and saying dump to disk uh, in x64 debug. So as you guys can see, uh, WinDebug pretty much, you know, has the same functionality plus much more than uh, x64 debug. It's just that everything is pretty much powered by the command line and there's no like real shortcuts for it with like mouse clicks. I think that's probably, at least for me, that's the biggest hurdle to starting to use it uh, is that you just have to remember those command line arguments. Yeah, and just the biggest things to keep in mind when you're taking baby steps with uh, WinDebug is just make use of these menus, right? Um, like if you forget, if you forget the command to continue, just hit go. Um, and then these are really useful too, because uh, you're going to have exception or thrown exceptions by certain types of malware and stuff. Stop debugging, uh, detaching. Like all this stuff is is mostly available in the menus. Um, and then you can, uh, the documentation for WinDebug is actually really good for Microsoft. So it won't be like a stack overflow post that you're reading. It's it's like actually really well documented commands. I think what we're gonna do is we'll probably link to uh, like Josh's favorite commands on our blog. We'll probably put up a few things that we cover in this video, just so that you have a nice cheat sheet. Uh, and then that way they're all sort of like the ones that you use day to day are just, will just be in one uh, PDF for you guys to use just to make it a bit easier. Cool. Yeah, so let's just take a quick look at this binary. And it actually does have linked PDB information, which is funny. Uh, yeah, and then if we look at uh, the strings for this binary, um, we can actually see uh, some raw C2s here. Yeah, it's definitely unpacked, but uh, I'd highly suggest taking a look at this binary because it has some pretty cool stuff. I called it, in my talk, I called it uh, TLDR because it actually has uh, that string here. So I called it the TLDR dropper because I thought it was kind of funny. I think we'll probably link to that uh, below if you guys want to go check out Josh's talk on it. I, I thought it was pretty interesting. <laughs> Cool. So I think with that, uh, that's going to kind of wrap up like our introduction here. So at least now starting out, you guys should be able to set up your workspace, get something loaded with the symbols, sort of do some basic uh, debugging with it, put breakpoints on APIs, dump memory. So these are all the things that we've covered in many of our other videos where we use x64 debug. Uh, hopefully we've just sort of covered off the bases here and we'll sort of leave it up to you guys. Uh, let us know in the comments below if you're interested in this, if you want to sort of like see us do more stuff with WinDebug, bring Josh back. Let us know and we'll have them back to talk about some more advanced stuff like debugging with multiple threads, uh, debugging calls into the kernel, that sort of stuff. Um, but we did want to just put out this sort of primer so that everyone gets on the same page. Uh, everyone's able to at least debug a binary in, in WinDebug. Is there anything else that you want to cover before we uh, take off? No, that's great. I just wanted to thank you for, for having me. I think oh, these thanks videos, to you. <laughs> uh, I think these videos are uh, are amazing. So I'm really, really happy to be part of this project. I'm going to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> no, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate it. And so, yeah, let us know if you want to see more, we'll bring Josh back. Thanks everyone. And, uh, until next time, keep exposing all the cans behind the malware. Stay curious. Just take a little piece of PEI.
Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. Way back in Newfoundland, Alberta, and Manitoba, Ontario, and BC. And you'll have found the stopping grounds of all my friends and me.